Travis, thank you, choir. What a beautiful song. It's good to be here this morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 21 through 26. Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. 
titled this morning's sermon, The Marks of a Murderer. The Marks of a Murderer. Now, verse 20 from Matthew chapter 5, which we looked at last week, is uh, the foundation or the key phrase to Jesus' entire Sermon on the Mount. So if you're new, um, you know that we're going through the Sermon on the Mount verse by verse um, as it is Jesus' most famous sermon. And um, the key verse is in verse 20 where he says, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, then you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we learned last week that our righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We're not just least in the kingdom of heaven, but we're unworthy of the kingdom of heaven. So in our text this morning, Jesus builds on verse 20 by giving us the first of six, you have heard it was said, statements, which is, of course, a reference to the law. And he'll show us how our righteousness really looks against the law. Not only is he showing us that our righteousness alone is not good enough, he's also setting the standard um, or the expectation for Christian ethics. So I want this to be clear, and I want you to write this down before you ever read this verse. We don't obey the commandments to get to God, right? But rather we obey the commandments because God has gotten in us. I want to say this again. I want you to write this down. We don't obey the commandments to get to God. You can't obey the commandments enough to get to God. But rather we obey the commandments because God has gotten in us. He lives in us because we have surrendered our lives to Him and we're now clothed in His righteousness. That's what salvation is all about. And we seek to please Him. And so these next six sections of the Sermon on the Mount affect in some way, shape, or form every single one of us. My advice to you as we tackle these passages is to open your heart, all right, and not get mad at me. That's my suggestion. But grow in Him. Grow in the Word. And with that said, let's dive into what He has to say about murder. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through verse 26. If you have it, say amen. All right, let's read Jesus' words together. It says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way first. Be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there. You have paid the last penny. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you again for your word. As hard as it is to digest, we thank you that you have given us the standard. But God, not that we can ever meet the standard, but that, that we know how to live and that we know that we are in need of a Savior. And so we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice upon the cross, the blood that was shed that brings forgiveness of sin, the resurrection that brings eternal life. God, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, may we now open our hearts and minds to receive your word. Lord, that we might apply it to our life, that we might grow in you. God, that we might know how to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we know how to treat those that we come in contact with. God, we just thank you for your word. May you bless this time together. May you bless each and every one of us as we study and learn about you and your teachings. Lord, we give you praise for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. 
Murder seems to be one of those things that separates good people from bad people, right? Um, if, if you were to ask any of you or if you were to ask anybody that you know, um, are you a good person? They'll most likely say, yes, I, I'm a good person. Well, why are you a good person? Well, I'm a good person because I've never killed anybody. I've wanted to, but I've never done it. I'm not, I'm not a murderer, and so therefore, I'm a good person. Murder seems to divide the good people from the bad, right? Murder is also one of those things that is wrong from culture to culture through all time. If you ever find yourself in an area where murder is okay, my advice to you would be to run Get out as quick as you can, because if murder's all right, you're in danger. But see, that's not the way it is. From culture to culture, throughout time, murder is wrong. Murder is wrong and deserving of judgment no matter where you are, no matter what culture you're in, in almost all people groups. And Jesus addresses it first here in verse 21. But, but listen to what he says in verse 22. Well, let's start verse 21, then we'll read verse 22 as well. He says, you've heard that it was said... To those of old, you shall not murder. We get that, right? It's wrong. It's wrong across all cultures. It's, cross, it's wrong across all people groups. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But listen to what he says in verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so he brings anger to the level of murder. And so now if I ask you, are you a good person? Well, yeah, I'm a good person. I never get angry. Well, now you're not a good person because you just lied. We all get angry, right? We've all been angry before. So he elevates anger to the point of murder. And so he says that they shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of counsel. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And what Jesus is doing here in verse 22 is giving us the marks of a murderer, all right? So he elevates anger to the place of murder, and he gives us these marks of a murderer. And so Jesus wants us to understand that murder is not just the act of taking someone's life, but it's actually a condition of the heart. So murder is not just the act of taking someone's life, but it's the condition of the heart. And we'll see this pattern this condition of the heart with all six sections that Jesus deals with in Matthew chapter 5 or the rest of Matthew chapter 5. So let me repeat this before we dive in any deeper. Jesus has a twofold purpose here. He has a twofold purpose here. One, to show us that we are unrighteous, right? That we are all unrighteous, uh, all unrighteous. And number two, he wants to show us how to be or how not to be. So he's laying out the standard. So let's examine the three examples or marks that Jesus gives us, and then let's look at our own life. Are we guilty of any of these things? But I also want you to notice as we go through these, the progression, how one builds on the other. So let's look at the marks of a murderer. Number one, anger is a murder marker. Anger is a murder marker. Look at the verse 22 again. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Same thing as murder there. So a mark of a murderer is anger. Now we all know that anger in and of itself is not a sin, right? When we talk about anger, we, we always get this, especially as a pastor. Um, we, we bring up things like, and, and I've done this myself, well, Jesus was angry. We know he didn't see him. He went into the temple. He flipped over tables. He drove out the money changers with a whip, right? And so he was angry, but he obviously didn't see him. We also know that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 six says, uh, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So I could be here all day talking about examples of anger. Is it a sin? Is it not a sin? Where does it become sin? All right, we're not going to do that. What Jesus is getting at here is that murder does not begin with the taking of a life, but rather begins with anger in your heart. Murder begins with anger in your heart, which Jesus says is liable to the judgment, just like murder. All right, we really start to see our, our unrighteousness now. 
So anger is an emotion, right? It's an emotion that we feel. And you know, as well as I do, that our emotions will get us in trouble. In our society today, we put a lot of emphasis on emotions, don't we? Well, do what feels good. Do what feels right. If it feels good to you, then have at it. But I'm telling you this morning, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, the Bible uh, doesn't say anything like that. As a matter of fact, um, our emotions will get us in trouble. You do what you feel is right. You do what you feel like doing. You're going to end up in a place that you don't want to be. And so anger is one of those emotions that if we don't have under control, that if we don't understand, it's going to lead us a place that we don't want to go and could even end up being a murderer ourselves with the taking of one's life. So, <clears throat> our emotions can get us in a lot of trouble, and the emotion of anger is ultimately what leads to the taking of a life, the act of murder. So that's how dangerous anger is. When anger is undealt with, it progresses, right? Just like I told the kids, when you get angry, what do you need to do? Well, you need to pray for sure. You know, you need to calm yourself down. That was a great answer, by the way. Calm yourself down. Count to ten. Anger never leads to anything positive when it's undealt with. Whenever you act or react in anger, it always goes a place that you don't want it to go. And once you get words out, once you get actions out, you can't take them back. You can apologize all you want, but you're not going to get those acts and those words back. So it's always a good idea to calm down. It's always a good idea uh, to pray. And so it progresses. So when it's undealt with, it leads to the second murder marker. And that is name calling. Name calling is a murder marker. Name calling is a murder marker. Look at what it says in verse 22 again. It says, And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, or judgment, is the same thing. Notice the progression from marker one to marker two. Marker one, no words are spoken, just an inward feeling, right? Just this feeling of anger. In marker two, this anger uh, shows itself or presents itself a little bit further by calling someone a name. This part of the verse deals with negative name calling, all right? Negative name calling. Raka, which, you know, how many of you ever called anybody Raka before? Um, no, we don't do that. So we're like, hey, I didn't call nobody Raka, I'm saved. Well, that's not what Jesus is intending here. The word Raka in the Greek language means empty headed, right? Um, but really, what makes it so bad is that it's equivalent to spitting on someone. That's what it's like. When you call someone raka, it's the equivalent of spitting on someone. When you actually say it right, the Greek word raka, it actually sounds like you're spitting. And that's where they got the word. And I'm not going to do that for you. Some of you may have weak stomachs. But anyway, that's where they get the word raka. And that's what it, it's equivalent to spitting on someone. Name calling has become the norm in our society today. As I was preparing for this, and I, I prepared a little bit early this week because we had to uh, go out of town for a day or so this week, and so I finished it up early. And as I was finishing up early, I started to pay attention to how people speak to each other. And of course, who was I around the most but my family? Not to throw them under the bus or not, but boy, was I amazed at how often we call people names. All right, not meaning to call out my family, but it wasn't just them either. But boy, we are bad about it. And it's just common. It's common. We call people names all the time. Right? How many times a day do we call someone stupid? How many times a day do we call someone an idiot? I mean, we do it all the time. Or, or, or some of you, some of you may even use even more derogatory words. We're not going to get into those today. We do it while we're driving. Let somebody cut me off. Listen here. Let, let, let somebody um, jump in front of me at Food Line or Walmart. We do it while watching the ball game. Thank goodness we didn't have to do it last night with the Carolina game, right? We do it during the ball games, right? Officials, Super Bowl, I'm guilty. I am guilty. You know, the Bible says you... 
you were the first no sin, cast the first stone or whatever it is, look, I'm guilty. I can't throw no stones because I was not happy with the Super Bowl. I was not happy with those officials. That was a face mask. I called him a name, not a cuss word, but I probably used one of those ones I just said a moment ago. I'm just being honest with you. Doesn't make it right. Guilty, unrighteous right here. Right here, unrighteous. I've called people names. And if you're honest, you probably called somebody a name on your way to church. Maybe even under your breath, you called your spouse a name. I don't know. I don't know, but we call each other names all the time. It's become the norm. We do it while we're talking to our friends, right? I believe this type of name calling is a sin. I believe it is. As a matter of fact, I know it is. Jesus says it is. He, I mean, he elevates it to the level of murder. All right? Whether, whether they hear you or not, it's not like, okay, it's a sin um, only if they hear me. No, it doesn't matter if they hear you or not, okay? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, we adults need to especially be careful um, calling people names, especially in front of our children. Because guess what? They pick up on it. And they'll take it to school. And our kids, they don't know that they shouldn't actually say it in front of somebody else. We, we adults, we're conditioned, right? We're conditioned to society. We understand that it's disrespectful to call somebody a name in front of them. Well, our kids don't know that yet. So what do they do? They go to school and they tell their teacher what they think, right? They call their teacher the same name that they heard mom and dad call the teacher as well. They don't know that they're not supposed to tell them. And so they pick up what we say. They pick up what we call people. And then we get mad at them and say, don't you know? No, they don't know. You don't want them to do that, then you don't do that. I've even heard name calling in church. Whew. Not going to spend much time there. But we ought to encourage each other in church. We ought to lift each other up in church, not tear each other down. We're not here to tear each other down. There are ways to handle situations without calling people names. See, we're all right when we're dealing with anger. You know, anger's an inward emotion. We get the name calling, and that's a little more personal because every one of us in here is guilty. And I'm not talking about when I, when I was, you know, a young Christian 35 years ago. Yeah, I did have a problem with name calling, but I don't anymore. I doubt that. I believe that we're all guilty of it. We're all unrighteous. That's what Jesus is doing. He's telling us how unrighteous we are, but he's also telling us that, hey, this is the standard for Christian living. This is the standard for Christian living here. So anger leads to name calling, and the name calling leads to the third mar marker of a murderer, and that is slander. Slander is a murder marker. This is very similar to what we just talked about in name calling, but a little bit different. The progression moves from anger to name calling to now slander. Listen to what Jesus says here in verse 22. He says, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, the word you fool in the Greek is where we get our English word moron. All right? That's where we get our English word moron, you fool. And that's basically what is meant. What you're doing is you're destroying the person's character. So you're destroying the person's character completely. It's not talking about a fool like it says in, in Proverbs, okay? Making a bad decision. This is talking about... Um, this is talking about someone's anger uh, or has so much anger within their heart and it comes to a point of hatred. So anger has led to name calling and has led to hatred, slanderer. So the person calls another person or the person that calls another a fool is seeking to destroy another's, uh, another person's character. And you guys know what I'm talking about here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Have you ever hated someone so much that you wanted, to, you wanted um, everyone or you didn't want anyone to see one ounce of good in that person? You've hated them that bad that you didn't, you didn't want anybody to see one ounce of good in that person. So every time that person come up in conversation, uh, you always talked about the bad, all the bad that they did. And doing that, you murder their character. You destroyed who they were in the other person's mind. You know how that happens all the time. This person don't even know this other person, but yet when you're talking, you've destroyed that character. And then whenever they get around that person, they already have this opinion because um, you've murdered them or murdered their character. 
So anger leads to hatred. Hatred brings about this behavior, slander. You may not physically kill the person. You may not take their life, but you'll come all the way to the edge and you'll destroy everything else about their life. See, the point that Jesus is making here with these three marks is that undealt with anger brings about unrighteousness. I think that just reading these few, we've realized that we're unrighteous, right? He wants us to see that we cannot possibly keep the law. We cannot possibly have righteousness apart from Jesus. We can't. We are in need of a Savior, church. We're all in need of a Savior. We're all guilty of probably all three of these marks of a murderer. I mean, that's how close we are to murdering. That's how close we are to actually taking the life of another person. This is the progression that Jesus lays out there. But Jesus knows this. He knows this about us. He knows that. And that's why he died on the cross. That's why he laid down his life. Jesus also, in his wisdom not only speaks to our anger or our hatred toward others, and this is where it gets hard, um, but he also speaks to the one who may be angry with us. So is someone angry with you? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where somebody is treating you different and you have no idea why? It's like one day everything's like good, and the next day it's like, wow, what happened? What did I do? You know, somebody just all of a sudden starts treating you bad or different and you don't have any idea what's going on, what you've done. It just seems like they're angry at you. Well, Jesus addresses that very situation right here. Look at verse 23 through verse 26. He's the, he says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, that your brother is angry with you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Listen to what verse 25 says. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with them, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. And surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. We don't always realize when we hurt people's feelings. We don't always realize when we've angered other people but guess what it happens we have this foot and mouth uh, condition that many of us have suffered from we don't really mean any harm our intentions wasn't to hurt them but sometimes it hurts sometimes you say things and it hurts even if you didn't intentionally mean to hurt anybody but if you realize somebody's treating you uh, different and they might be angry with you then you have to address it so not only do we need to avoid being angry calling names, slandering one's character, but we also need to be aware of those who may be angry with us. Listen to this, church. Jesus is putting all the responsibility of anger and hatred on the Christian to deal with and to do it quickly. So this whole anger issue, whether you're the one angry or not, is still your responsibility. As a believer, it is your responsibility to deal quickly with anger, whether it's your anger or someone else's anger. Jesus knows and understands that anger, whether in your heart or someone else's heart, when left to fester, will be destructive. I'm sure you've seen people like that. They have so much pinned up anger. I mean, it's just, you can just see it. And then they, and they, think, they say things like this, catch me outside, how about that? You know, you know, anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? You watch Dr. Phil, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As a young lady, or if you have social media, I told you, you guys ought to get Facebook, you see a lot of funny stuff on there. But anyway, this young lady sitting on Dr. Phil trying to get some help, and I mean, she is just wild, 13 years old and wild. And so the audience begins to laugh, and she gets angry because it's pent up anger, and she starts hollering for them to meet her outside so she can fight every one of them. Anger, just pent up anger. And when we have this kind of anger, we're ready to fight, we're ready just to throw down with whatever comes our way. Anger needs to be dealt with quickly, whether it's you who are angry or it's someone angry with you. Regardless, undealt with anger is very costly. 
very costly. And Jesus makes that clear in verse 26. Look what he says. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. It's better to deal with anger or guess what? The consequences can be quite devastating. A, a relationship could be severed and done forever. A friendship that has lasted 20 years, if not dealt with, could be over just like that. But in closing, keep your Bibles open because I still want to read one more verse. But in closing, it's, it's not a sin at the moment. Um, murder is not a sin the moment a life is taken. Okay? It becomes sin the moment anger is not dealt with. Anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to murder. Do not think today that you're okay in your anger. Do not think that today you're okay in your anger. Jesus makes it clear that anger interferes with your worship. Anger interferes with your worship. Look at verse 23. He says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, you all came today bearing a gift, your heart, your life, your worship. Okay? So this is you. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Anger interferes with worship. I wonder how many times people sit through church each week and never feel the Holy Spirit move or never recognize God's presence in this place. And it's all because they have anger in their heart. It's all because they've got this undealt with anger in their life or, or let's call it what it is, sin. We don't feel the presence of God because we have sin in our life. We have anger in our hearts. Are you angry with anyone this morning? Are you holding a grudge towards someone today? Do you hate somebody? Let's just be honest. Do you hate somebody? Or is there someone angry with you? Anybody got a grudge against you? Are you hated by another person? If so, Jesus says it's your responsibility to make it right and to do it quickly. By not addressing your anger, you are sinning. And you're coming up short in your worship of God. And the thought that you can deal with sin and have it there and packed away nice and neat and have your anger and your grudges and all that kind of stuff in here and still worship, you can't do it. Not effectively. You put on a good show, maybe. But you need to deal with your anger. Our purpose to bring God glory and our anger does not bring Him glory. Maybe you're angry today with God. Maybe you've gone through some things and you're angry with God this morning. Because of life's difficulties. I want to tell you that, that He loves you this morning. And He knows what you're going through. He, he wants to make things right with you. He's called you. Why don't you accept His Son? Why don't you accept Jesus? You need to deal with your anger toward God. If not, it will not end well.